rtcfm.com. We're streaming audio live on RTC Channel 5, and we'll soon have audio and video on RTC Channel 4. Dakota, how are you? Good, how are you? Oh, good. Welcome back. And, of course, on this Wednesday morning, time to visit with Mr. John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Good morning. Good Pleasure morning. to be here. Yeah, nice to have you with us. Because the board of trustees were in session yesterday. Yesterday, we had our uh, monthly board meeting. All right. And, uh, you know, we're kind of again in those, what we call the dog days for us. Kind of in between uh, finishing up last year, getting ready for next year's budget. So not a lot going on. We did have Molly Hardesty come in, who's our director of radiology, to give an update on the 3D mammal. What we would like for the directors to do, about 90 to 120 days after a new piece of equipment is installed or a new program, just give an update to the board. Because, you know, we always do our performance and say, we think it's going to do this. What did it actually do in that time period? So uh, we actually, you know, exceeded some of our expectations. Good. So it's going really well, being very well received by the patients, uh, some of that new technology. Uh, physicians, radiologists just love it because it allows them much earlier detection. If, if there's a small nodule, now they can see it. For before, it might have just been a shadow where it's very well defined now. So, uh, you know, we're having what's called less callbacks. Under the old system, if something didn't look quite right, we'd call the patient, have them come back in. Well, you know, that's got to scare them to death. Uh, I just had my mammogram. Now they want me to come back. We're seeing far less of those now because this is such a much clearer image radiologist has a much you know clear picture so you know now if we do get a call back this there's a you know they finally found something instead of well it's just kind of a shadow we we need to look at it again so uh patients just love that that new technology and and the physicians love it probably one of the best things we've done in, in a while to serve our community several weeks ago she was a guest on dick belcher's friday morning program the first federal program and explained about it talked about it a little bit State of the art it is. equipment. Yes. It really That's, is, according uh, to you know, what she was saying. It took us a while to get there, right. uh, but we finally, you know, got to that technology that, you know, we're hoping that, uh, you know, it's going to be basically the standard of care as we move forward. And it's just once you see what this piece of equipment can do compared to the, the traditional one we've had in the past, it's just, you know, it's, it's a Hugo against a Ferrari. You know, it's <laughs> one of those type of things. So it's just, we uh, just hope everybody, every hospital needs to get this technology. It makes a difference in the lives of those ladies who are sure. coming in for that breast cancer screening. It does make a difference. Excellent. So, you know, that went very well. Okay. Um, we did have then several of our uh, directors come and do a presentation on new IV pumps. The ones we've had in the, in the building has been there since 2006. Still working. Right. But... There's some new technology now where it's, you know, like everything else, a little more electronics in it, a little more computer driven. So what we found, the the ones we're going to replace the, the, our current set with allows for a computer to basically re-verify what the staff member puts in. So, you know, if you put in a point one, it should have been a point oh one, it will stop and say, are you sure you want to do that? Which is, from a patient safety is just immense because we're human. You know, you can, like me, if I'm on a computer, I fat finger everything. <laughs> um, you know, so it really prevents that. It, it stops the staff member from doing something that that computer says, this doesn't make sense to me. So we, we tell it what those parameters are. So it's a double check, triple check on all these. So again, uh, that was approved yesterday. You know, it's not very cheap. I think the total projects could be around $110,000. But when you consider the the patient safety that's involved with that, that's a drop in the bucket. It's well worth that. So uh, anxious to get those in. Staff is just, they can't wait to get some of this in because it makes their life a lot easier. Again, one more safety check that we have out there to make sure what we're doing is safe for the patients. So uh, what happens to the old units? We'll probably just, uh, I don't know if there's a trade-in or not. Okay. I think because of their age, there's probably no trade-in on probably those. Probably not. Yeah. They're getting close to what we call end of life, which means manufacturer yeah. tells us if they break, we can't fix them anymore. No parts or anything. There's no parts right. anymore. So, you know, we've got our money's worth, you know, 2006 to 13 years out of them. And they're usually a, a seven to eight year life cycle on these. So uh, we've got our money's worth. They've served us well, but there's better, newer stuff out there. That's what we have to move up to. Okay, excellent. Uh, we had several emergency management plans. We're required each year to have, you know, basically an emergency plan for everything. Then board has to approve those. So we submitted about 11 yesterday. We've probably got another 20 we'll submit over the rest of the year. And it was kind of timely is that uh, last week we actually put into place our uh, external disaster when we lost the power. You know, that's a pretty big deal for us. Uh, even though we have emergency generator, 
still that only gives us about 60 percent coverage in the building so you know we had to do some shuffling around of folks uh, a lot of our clinics off-site do not have emergency power so now where do we put those patients so it it uh may just put our plan to work and uh, we always train for it and i've always you know it's obvious we do better in the real thing than we do in the training or when we have a drill. Uh, I think because people know it's a drill, so they kind of, okay, they, they go through the motion. Human you know, nature. Human nature. <laughs> and, but when the real thing's there, it was amazing how well they did. And we were close to doing it uh, Monday afternoon. Uh, once I kind of saw what the storms were developing south of us, the initial indication was that they were going to head right straight for Rochester. Right. Went to the hospital, worked with the house supervisor. You know, we got some patients moved out of, you know, areas that could be dangerous. And then we just monitored that storm. And unfortunately, there was some damage south of us, but no injury. So it was nice, but we were ready. If I had to, uh, we had some people on a call list. If we saw there was going to be injuries, additional patients coming to our facility, we have folks that we could call in to help with that kind of the overflow, uh, max patient flow we was going to get. So two times okay. here in a, in a week or so, I hope we're done doing our emergency uh, disaster plans. Uh, it's all behind us and we have some smooth sailing. We'll hope so. We hope so. That's right. And finally, then we got into the uh, financials for the month. Uh, for the month of April, we had gross revenue about $12.8 million. Our deductions are our write-offs, which is our the contracts we have with the various payers, government, or, or self-pay people. Wrote off about eight point two million. We had uh, eight, uh, excuse me, four point six million of money to spend. And we spent four point nine. Uh, <laughs> you know, so we did have a. You know, we spent more than we took in for the month. So we had an operating loss about two hundred eighty-three thousand. We had some non-operating income, which is like the cafeteria sales various things like that that, you know, it's not really patient related, but it's still income to us of 201,000. So we wound up with a net loss for the month of 81,000. We were hoping for a profit, but you know, it wasn't that bad. So again, this is kind of our slow time when we get in the summer months where we usually see less volumes coming in. Monitoring it closely, uh, our goal is by the end of the year to have an operating profit. Uh, so we're not looking at some of our you know non-operating income to support us because that's kind of that income could go away very quickly. And there's some government programs that we participate in that we put in that non-operating because it's not direct day-to-day patient care. And, you know, that's one of those easy come, easy go. The government gives you the money. They can take it away just as fast. So we want to make sure we get an operating profit without some of that that non-operating. We're not quite there yet. So we're, you know, we're tweaking things as we go and hope by the end of the year have all that figured out so we do have an operating profit by the okay. end of the year. All right. And that was pretty well the board report. Pretty well took care of it. Yes. John, I want to ask you about measles. Have you had any uh, seen any measles cases in Fulton County and Rochester? No. Now, we've had you know some folks come in concerned that the, their children might have been exposed. So, of course, at that point, we run all the, the tests on those. So we have not had any confirmed here. Okay. I think we've had one up in the Angola area. Uh, it's probably the closest case that we had, and, and I'm pretty sure that came from a southern Michigan exposure. But uh, haven't seen any here. Um, Fortunately, because you know it's a fairly serious disease, and uh, but we're constantly watching, and every now and then somebody will come in and uh, you know concerned that their child might have those. Um, you know, if you can't, if you suspect that, you know, try again with your pediatrician, your family doc. If you can't get there, definitely come. And let's, it's better to be safe than sorry. So you know, if they do have the measles, you can take the proper steps to protect them and the rest of the family. How was the winter for flu for Woodlawn? I know one time we had uh, shut the hospital down in terms of that. Right, it's we're pretty well past that right okay. now. Uh, you know, was I, it as you expected it to be? It was a yeah. Okay. It was one of those. You know, the year before it was far worse than we expected because the the vaccine was you know, very bad. It, did, it wasn't effective. It wasn't working. This right. year it was fairly good. I think that you know it's one of those they guess each year when they put that together what strains of the flu they think they're going to uh, be exposed to. So I think they got it pretty close this year. Still has some folks come in. What we found, a lot of the folks that came in did not get the flu vaccine. Uh, and so it, definitely they got it. We had a few folks that came in who did have the vaccine, still got the flu, but it wasn't as severe as it would have been. So there's definite advantage to doing that. Either it will prevent you from getting it, or if you do happen to catch it, it's going to really reduce those symptoms and the length of time that you're feeling lousy. So you know, as it gets to flu season again, can't stress enough. Please get your flu shots. Uh, it does make a difference. On the table for Woodlawn Hospital, maybe between now and the end of the year, anything significant coming up? I know you mentioned the 
new purchases you're making now. Yeah, I th- right now we see nothing on the horizon. Okay. Uh, we've got a few things that we're looking probably for next year. And it's one of those, uh, you know, some roof repairs. Unfortunately, you know, that is a very expensive endeavor when you look at the amount of square foot of roofing that we have. So we're trying to get some quotes there. There's a couple spots I think we can probably do some temporary fix to to get us through until we get into the next budget season. Uh, we do have some work we're doing with rural health clinics trying to convert some of our designation for our physician offices. And from a patient perspective, it's fairly transparent. It really doesn't mean a lot to them. But again, it's another one of those government programs. That if we can get them designated as a rural health clinic, our reimbursement is greatly enhanced from what we get in. And, uh, you know, because we take that money, whatever we get in goes back into the organization for, you know, like the new mammogram, like sure. the new IV pumps. Sure. You know, it goes back in for patient care. So the, the more cash we can get coming in, the better technology we can put in to serve the community and, and our patients that we see. Doctor supply? Still looking for those. Uh, it's getting more and more critical. Uh, the, the issue basically is family practice docs. It's a hard profession for get the kids into. Uh, they kind of look what their parents, because a lot of them that are in family practice, their mom or dad is a family practice physician. And they're wanting to get into some sort of subspecialty, and I call it the blankologist. And uh, the reason is, you know, when I talk to them, I don't have to work nights. I don't do weekends. I don't do holidays. And I make three times the money my parents did because I'm a blankologist right. instead of family practice. And, you know, the family practice, uh, people don't realize how versatile they are. That They do a lot. Um, you know, they're, they're virt- virtually on call 24-7, 365. You know, we try to do rotating call within our physicians, so they're just not there all the time. So it is a drain on you. It's a strain to be a family practice physician. It takes a special person to say, I want to do that, especially in a rural community. Right. You know, the other thing I fight is, well, yeah, I want to be a family practice, but there's this group of 57 physicians in downtown Chicago I can go to. <laughs> you know, so the very little call coverage... And again, they're in that big city. So we we're kind of fighting two things, the family practice and a, and a rural community. The docs that we do find that come in, you know, uh, we've been interested in, they've been interested in us. Some of them are still in school, which is a good thing because we kind of get to watch their development. And it, uh, they say, I want to do rural family practice medicine. They're committed to that. So that's a rare breed. So the problem is not only am I looking at them, there's 57 other hospitals trying to all court them to come to their facility. And uh, you know, I kind of feel sorry f- for them at times because they got to feel like a piece of meat because <laughs> everybody's saying, come to me, come to me. And they're getting pulled all these different directions. At the same time, they're trying to go through a very difficult field of study. So, you know, we, we I try to let them know, hey, I'm interested, but I'm not going to bug you. Right. You know, you need to get your education. We're here. If you have questions, call me. So it, uh, we, we got a couple that we're looking at uh, probably within the next six to eight months. Hopefully, they'll be making a decision. Affordable Care Act still working for Woodlawn? Still working. Okay. Uh, you know, we keep hearing off and on. They're trying to repeal it again. Again, uh, part of it's good. Part of it's bad. And, uh, you know, so what we do, we maximize on that good part of it. We try to minimize, you know, some of the bad aspects of it. And, uh, you know, it started off, uh, I think it was much more beneficial to some of our patients than what it is now because we've had so many in the marketplace say, I'm not making enough money, the insurance companies. So they're dropping the product. And when we first started, there was probably four or five different providers in our area. And I think we're down to maybe one now. And uh, it's just because... You know, they got greedy, to be honest. Uh, you know, I, when we met with some of them, uh, several of the CEOs around the state a few years ago, we told them, you're going to lose money your first three to four years because the only people that's going to sign up for it are sick people. The well people aren't going to do it right now. So you're going to have to float this plan until you get some of those others coming on board. And they just didn't wait. You know, they, they weren't making enough money, so they, they dropped the program. So, you know, it's, it's sad for the patients that, you know, now they're back either underinsured or uninsured but from you know, our perspective we're still going to treat you you know so you know don't worry about that come see us if you're if you need to see a physician come see us we're there to take care of you do you find the fry, the price of prescription drugs is going up and and maybe keeping people away from what they should be what they should be doing for their own wellness the reason i asked that question we had senator mike braun in yesterday afternoon mm-hmm. And he, he addressed that issue and said he felt like the drug companies were, to a degree, getting greedy, as you used that term earlier. And, you know, I've never been one to be careful what I say, and I have to, <laughs> I have to agree with him. You know, I think all health care in general is too expensive, and it's, we're a, a, you know, kind of a victim of our own problems. 
and uh, you know each year as we start looking to you know what is our price going to be for our, our service next year and what kind of price increase do we need to put into place what drives that more than anything is the insurance companies telling us what discount we're going to give them because you have to work backwards to your bottom line you know uh every year we get hammered for you know well you give us a 28 percent discount on our bill last year we want a 32 percent next mm-hmm. year so you know as we look at our contractuals we're running writing off right around 60 some percent uh, or more of our gross charges before we even try to collect them that's n- that's a broken system and you know if we could get and i've said before get everybody to pay us exactly what we bill them no discounts we could dramatically reduce the cost of our health care. So when we start looking at gross revenue in health care, I said that that's a bogus number. You know, it's an inflated number because we're charging three and four times what we should because by the time we go through all the discounts to finally collect what we get to cover our expenses, that's our true cost. Exactly. And, uh, you know, so we, we need to get to that point, but I, I, I won't see it in my lifetime. Uh, I, I think the system is so weighted down with, you know, this game that we play. And, cumbersome. And it's cumbersome. Yeah. And, and we're constantly playing the game, well, you want a 20% discount, so I need to raise my prices 2%, so I can still maintain my 3% margin. You know, it, it's, it's an accountant's nightmare. It's, you know, for whatever reason, it's a profession I chose to get into. <laughs> uh, it, it's still fun. It's still challenging. But it, it, the system's broken, and unfortunately, if I had the answer, I think I could, you know, retire a, a billionaire. There's not an easy answer for any of this. It's sure, that take, would mean so I could retire. I absolutely too. will. <laughs> it, it's just going to take all of us to work together, right. not only, you know, from the providers, the insurance companies, the drug companies. We've got to get to that point where we're talking with each other and say, we're out of control. What can we do to reduce the cost of health care? Because the people that suffer are those who have no insurance. It's the self-insured, self-pay. You know, they come in and, and we're billing them full boat, you know, uh, because that's our, what our charge master says we have to do. So, uh, you know, I've been in healthcare care a long time. I've been trying to fix this problem for a long time. I'm too small a voice in a big ocean. But, you know, we recognize that. And we try to work with our folks that come in, especially if they have no insurance. What can we do, you know, to help you? you know get this bill taken care of because it is the system's out of control and unfortunately it's a broken system it's going to take years and years and years to fix it and all the plans that i see you know with different politicians say well we need to do this we need to do that they've never been in the out in the trenches they need to come out sit in some of the small hospitals offices say what's going on here i think at that point they get a better understanding what we're up against and hopefully that would help them formulate a workable plan so that everybody benefits from it. You know, I, I'm a firm believer in health care. We need to make a profit. Uh, we can't keep open without you know, a positive bottom line. But how we get there now, it's a broken system. You make mention of the fact that someone who is having trouble with their bill at Woodlawn contact you absolutely talk about it discuss it that's see, all we see ask how you can work it you know, out. don't don't just ignore us because right. at that point you know it leaves us very few options if you know we're contacting you we'll send out numerous statements phone calls if we don't hear back from you you know we've got nothing left to do but to say well let's we have to send this to collections we got to right. do something with this if you communicate with us and say hey i'm having problems can we work something out we have several different plans that we can help you with um you know there's some short-term financing where it's interest free where you know x number of dollars per month uh you know you might qualify for our compassionate care program based upon your income level and number of people in your household but you got to talk to us you, you got to communicate with us and allow us that opportunity to try to work with you to figure out a workable solution for both of us you know we, we don't want to send people to collections but you know sometimes you got to protect our interest because again We've got to generate the cash to keep the building open. And, uh, you know, sometimes you got to do things that you're not comfortable with. Collections is not something our, we like to do, but we got to try to capture whatever cash we can so we can, again, put the infrastructure back in place with the mammograms, the IV pumps, that new technology so that our patients can get the best care that we can offer. John Alex, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Any thoughts about next month's meeting? Don't know. Okay. Uh, I got, like I say, there's nothing really major coming up. Uh, we're hoping to have maybe some uh, feedback from uh, we submitted our applications for the RHC project. And uh, what we get from the government is it could be from f- two to 17 weeks. You know, it's one of, you know, the, 
we're working on their time now, so uh, <laughs> we don't know when we'll hear back from them. Uh, we do know at some point they'll come and do an inspection of all of our physician offices. Uh, we know we're not going to pass it. That's their job is to find something. Uh, so we'll probably get a little of a, a work list, say you need to fix this, fix that. We'll fix it, submit it, and then we'll finally get them the designation. So we're hoping to have all that in place as we you know roll into 2020, have RHC in place to help, again, generate some additional cash that we can put back into the organization. John Alley, as always, we appreciate your time this morning. Thanks very much for being here. Thanks for sharing with us. My pleasure to be here. Thank you.